God, I love summer. Summer gives me time to do stuff. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Jeff McMahon, I'm uh, working on two books right now. Well, actually, one book is done. The Road to Swoleville, The Education of a Musclehead is done. I'm going to read to you uh, chapter two today. Try to keep these chapters short. Then um, I had a book. I took it off uh, Amazon Kindle, The Secret Life of Watch Addicts. There was too much uh, exposition so I, I hacked it off. I'm rewriting it. So it's just a pure narrative. I'm going to call it uh, Aristid Development. And then uh, once I read a few more chapters of The Road to Swoleville, I'll, um, I'll start. I mean, if you guys are into Aristid Development, I'll read the whole thing. Because I'm trying, well, as long as I keep the chapter short, I'll be able to read the whole thing. I don't want to read long chapters. In fact, uh, I may wear my glasses today. Let me see. Clark Kent. You got a Clark Kent things going on. Yeah, I may wear glasses today. So... Today I'm wearing a uh, Seiko Tuna. This is the SBBN 049. And I have it back on the uh, the bracelet just because there's something about having a monochromatic watch where the case and the bracelet all look the same. It just, I don't know, there's a power to it. Are you going to start doing Superman? You already got your Clark Kent thing going on. Yeah, I don't know, there's a power to this. This watch, um, I have a history with this watch. I've had many of the tuna quartz tunas and it's the only quartz in my collection this particular one I remember all the way back to 2012 maybe around there I had my first tuna it was the SBBN 017 looked amazing here's the thing man when you have a thousand dollar watch that has hard lex crystal on it this one has sapphire by the way for me that creates a cognitive dissonance I'm looking at that watch and I'm going, wow, this is a thousand dollar watch. And yet, it doesn't have the full, you know, it doesn't have the full sapphire. It, it, it'd it be like me buying a $60,000 car and there's like, I don't know, cloth seats, uh, fake leather seats. I think there's a certain price point, should be leather. There's a certain price point for a watch. It should be a sap sapphire. So I finally settled on this one. And uh, I have it on the uh, bracelet. And thank God it has a ratcheting clasp because my wrist changes size in the summer. So this was a very, um, this was a defining watch for me when I got that 017 12 years ago. Because when I spent close to a grand on that watch 12 years ago, that was a statement to me that, wow, dude, you're, you're taking this watch hobby seriously. You're forking out a grand? Wow. You just uh, opened up the Overton window, buddy, because honestly, that led to some higher purchases as well. Um, the only uh, other watch I can think that had a defining effect on me was uh, 2010, two years earlier. It was the first Gen Seiko Monster because that watch which was 200 bucks and I owned it like eight times but you couldn't hack it and it would drive me crazy I have to shake it I have to shake it no, I can't I can't do this but um, it got me off the TV the oversized TV watches that was a sad day man that's like a Paul Thomas Anderson movie the days I was watching TV and ordering uh, watches from the shopping uh, networks Ooh, that hurts dude I can't even make the video now thanks a lot so um I'm enjoying this. Uh, mostly I wear mechanical divers. Now I've been here, I, I guess I've been out of the loop. I've been hearing a lot lately that watch sales are down. Luxury watch sales are down. Swiss luxury is down because of uh, a lot of reasons. One being smart watches. I don't think I could wear a smart watch. I don't think I could do it. Um, constant surveillance. Um, constant connectivity and surveillance sounds dehumanizing. Um, defining my well-being with a barrage of metrics. I don't define how happy I am by metrics. Uh, th there's no way that uh, metric... Th you can't put a number on certain things. Uh, there's a, a great song from the 80s, uh, Simple Minds, Don't You Forget About Me. I get really excited when that song's on. There's no smart watch that can capture the magic I feel when I hear uh, 
Don't You Forget About Me by Simple Minds or some of the songs by Talk Talk from the 80s or if you want to go into the 70s, you know. You know, there's a love ballad by the Isley Brothers, uh, Living for the Love of You. I don't know. What, what am I going to do? Wear a smartwatch? You're, you're experiencing infatuation. I don't know. I can't do it, man. So I doubt I'll be uh, wearing a smartwatch. On the other hand, uh, maybe I, I'm part of the problem with this reduced sales in uh, watches because um, I only own six watches. Maybe my minimalism has had a deleterious, you just use the word deleterious, maybe uh, maybe my minimalism has had a harmful effect. I want to go back to the word deleterious. Let's, let's stick with that for a while. Maybe my, uh, my minimalism has had a harmful effect on, um, on what, because I am such a huge uh, social influencer. Dude, look in the mirror and slap yourself when you say that. No, I'm sure that I'm not responsible for the... Uh, for the decline in watch sales. I didn't even know there was a decline in watch sales. It's just been, the it's been trickling in, but I, uh, I don't think I could wear a smart watch. Mm, constant surveillance, constant connectivity, constant metric feedback to define my well-being. I think I'll pass. I think I'll pass. So anyways, that's my rant for today as I wear the Seiko Tuna. Powerful. All right, so, uh, in the first chapter I read to you yesterday, um, I had lost a ton of weight. I was working at uh, UPS, and I just naturally lost weight, so I figured you've already lost this weight, so you might as well just go on a low-carb diet and enter uh, Mr. Chine San Francisco. So let's let's go to this. This is called the Frank Zane look. I'll put my Clark Kent uh, glasses on. I entered Mr. Chine San Francisco as a natural. It was just a polite way of saying I didn't take steroids. And as a result, lost so much muscle that I looked less like a bodybuilder and more like a guy who just finished SEAL training. At 6 feet and 180 pounds, I was a lean, mean, posing machine, managing to pull off the Frank Zane look. Just well enough to snag runner-up against a blonde guy who was juiced up like an overripe orange. This guy had me beat in both muscular density and stomach cramps. The latter, courtesy of a last minute medjool date binge that had his muscles popping out like balloons and his stomach writhing in agony as if he had just gone 12 rounds with Mike Tyson. The day after the contest, I was sprawled out at home, basking in the glory of my almost victory and recovering from the grueling marathon of flexing and fake smiling when my phone started ringing off the hook. Apparently, the contest registry had handed out my phone number like it was a free sample at Costco. Suddenly, I was fielding calls from strangers who wanted me to model for their magazines. Some of these guys sounded sketchier than a back alley plastic surgeon, so I turned them down with the firmness of a bouncer at Studio 54. But one call came from a woman who seemed more legit, an art student at UCSF who wanted me to pose for her portfolio. Tempting, right? Sure, if you're into awkward coffee shop meetings and being immortalized in someone's weird art project, I politely declined. Why? The list of depressing excuses. First off, I was too exhausted from cutting down to 180 pounds and wanted nothing more than to disappear into my couch. Second, I was lazy and the thought of taking on a new challenge was about as appealing as a root canal performed by a dentist with shaky hands. But the real kicker? I was, and still am, a natural-born worrywart with a talent for reclusiveness. The idea of meeting a strange woman in San Francisco and risking an awkward encounter had me more nervous than a turkey at Thanksgiving. By rejecting these offers, I was tossing out the playbook I'd memorized from my bodybuilding Bible, Arnold, The Education of a Bodybuilder. Arnold Schwarzenegger's biography taught me that I should be leveraging my physique into other ventures, acting, business, even politics. But as it turned out, I lacked Arnold's gregarious personality and his lust for life. 
While Arnold was out there charming the pants off the world and marketing his body like a PR genius, I was more content hiding under a rock, avoiding adventure and human contact, like there were contagious diseases. If there had been a way to market my body while staying indoors and avoiding people, I would have been the undisputed king of the fitness world. But alas, I was destined for a different path, one paved with introversion and a career as a college writing instructor that would span five decades. <sighs> There's only one Arnold. He's a unique specimen with a personality and charisma so larger than life that it's practically its own zip code. But make no mistake, he influenced me and millions of other impressionable souls in the 1970s. We got bitten by the bodybuilding bug, packed our gym bags, and set off on the road to Swoleville. I started the journey over 50 years ago in 1974 when I was just 12 and already training for Olympic weightlifting. For the next 30 years, I haunted various gyms five or six days a week, moving weights like a man possessed. And for the last 20 years, I've been swinging kettlebells in my garage with a kind of dedication usually reserved for circuit training cult members. During all these decades, I've consumed 200 grams of bioavailable protein a day, which is just a fancy way of saying I've eaten more chicken breasts and albacore tuna than a mid-sized restaurant chain. Yeah, that's a lot of mercury, McMahon. You might want to slow down on the tuna. Okay. <laughs> okay. For me, working out almost every day and eating a high-protein diet aren't just options. They're essential for keeping the chaos at bay and giving me that ever-elusive competitive edge. This competitive streak didn't start with me. It's practically encoded in my DNA, courtesy of my father. And while I may not be out there charming the world like Arnold, at least I can deadlift my body weight and whip up a mean protein shake. So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Now, now if you like this, I'll, I'll keep uh, reading some of the shorter chapters to you. The Road to Swoleville, the education of a muscle head. I like the sound of it. It sounds appropriately absurd and comical because it's about obsession, and obsessions tend to be absurd and comical. I think I figured that out when my obsession bled into the timepiece arena. So that's it, man. Ladies and gentlemen, let me know what you think of this. Uh, after reading a few, few more of these chapters from uh, The Road to Swalville, then I think I'm going to try. Uh, I got the whole book done, uh, Aristid Development, and we'll see how that goes. Uh, Aristid Development, I'll probably just publish, uh, self publish on Kindle. The Road to Swalville, I'll spend the next month marketing it to uh, literary agents. But they're a tough nut to crack, we'll see. Uh, I I I had a literary agent ooh, 15 years ago. It was tough to land that person, and uh, it's interesting now. Getting a literary agent is far more difficult than when I got one 15 years ago. And then when he couldn't sell the book, he he just ghosted me. I was ghosted, ladies and gentlemen. So, anyways, yeah, it's a tough business. So, but but I don't even know if we read that much anymore. We tend to look at um, lunatics on YouTube channels. What are you talking about, McMahon? All right. Ladies and gentlemen, tell me what you think. Until next time, I'm out.